Welcome to Our Life in Transition. Listener discretion is advised. This podcast deals with issues about LGBT families and trans-specific topics. We would love to hear from you and welcome your questions and comments. However, we will not tolerate any discriminatory language or hate speech. So please, just don't do it. Enjoy the show. Welcome to Coffee Break, presented by Our Life in Transition. Uh, I am Rachel, and uh, this is the sixth coffee break. I am actually drinking coffee today. The first coffee break I've done with actual coffee. Today I thought I would talk a little bit about me, a little bit about my chronic issues that I am battling, because I know, you know, we allude to them now and again on the larger podcast, but uh, today I thought I'd go a little in-depth and uh, talk to you about what it's like to live with a chronic illness and uh, the journey that I've been on with that. So yeah, uh, let's get into it. So I have been battling various chronic illnesses throughout my life. First thing that I've battled first thing that came up was uh, when I was four, I started having migraines, which is uh, horrific for a four-year-old. My parents actually thought I had a brain tumor because uh, one of the other kids in town had just been diagnosed with a brain tumor, so it was top of mind. But after a bazillion specialists, um, I was diagnosed with migraines bazillion specialists, MRIs, all the, the whole bit. Um, I was diagnosed with migraines. Some of them are hormonal. Some of them are allergy related. So they tell me, but I've recently found out that it's also a, I guess you call comorbidity with, uh, my EDS. So, uh, yeah, and some of my my headaches that have been diagnosed as migraines are not actually migraines. Um, they're actually tension headaches and things like that because that are caused by my EDS. But so I've been battling those since I was four. I have periodically been on and off different medications for them, trying to control them. But I've gotten to a point where a lot of the times I'm able to just muscle through them because I've grown so used to my head hurting that it's kind of rare for my head not to hurt, to be honest. So, but that diagnosis came fairly early and, you know, when they thought that it was allergies, then I had allergy shots for a bazillion years and all of that good stuff, which is actually an adventure because where we live when I was four, there were no allergists in the area. Um, so I actually had to, for every time we had to go to the allergist, I had to, we had to travel like an hour and a half to get to the allergist and, uh, and stuff like that. There are more in the area now, but you know, that was 35 years ago. So anyway, so I have those migraines and then, so as a teenager, I was, uh, always a klutz, I guess everybody would say, you know, I was constantly turning my ankles, never breaking them, always badly spraining them, which was kind of weird because I always just turned my ankles. I never actually broke them, but like while I was a teenager, it was always my ankles, always. My ankles were the weakest part. And then toward the end of high school, I had really intense 
back pain that actually was so bad that my senior year, in September of my senior year, my parents actually took me to an orthopedist, a back specialist, and actually it was on 9-11 that I was uh, going to the back specialist because I remember we were traveling to the back specialist when everything happened, so I was not in high school that day. I was not in school that day. I was actually on the Pennsylvania Turnpike. Uh, when all of that was happening. So my experience is a little different than some of the other people that were, you know, in school when 9-11 happened. Uh, but I digress. So we went to the back specialist and the back specialist was no help. I mean, basically they said, you're fat, which, you know, thank you. I know that. But, uh, but my back still really hurts. And, you know, to, to be honest, I've, I've, I've been fat, but the back pain is new. So I got nowhere with them. They said lose weight. And I tried. I mean, I have struggled with my weight my entire life, but um, I did all kinds of horrible, like, uh, medications that, you know, were coming out for for weight loss that like so you didn't absorb fat and stuff like that which have horrible side effects oh my god horrible and I don't recommend any of them I did slim fast I did eventually I ended up having gastric sleeve surgery but it didn't help the back pain I still had back pain I still had pretty severe back pain then I went to another doctor and they diagnosed me with facet nerve syndrome, which is basically the nerves that run along the side of your spinal column get pinched and then they create horrible monstrous pain. So I went through a series of shots for that where they cut the nerve. Well, first they went in there and shot the nerve full of lidocaine, which helped for five minutes. And then they did that again and then they cut the nerve, but the upshot of all of that is they can only cut the nerve, apparently, as I understand it, you can only cut the nerve so many times because every time you damage a nerve, nerves regenerate and they grow like little like branches and legs and stuff like that. And so there comes a point where you keep cutting it and cutting it and cutting it and it's like a hydra and you can't, then you stop being able to cut all of that little those little branches and then you don't get any relief and then you just have a bigger mess so that was not going to be a sustainable thing for me so then the next theory was that well maybe it was stress related and so I started going to a therapist and my therapist uh, was great and I went to her for many many years and um, she did hypnosis for pain management and stress relief but for pain management and she taught me you know the techniques to do self-hypnosis so that I could so that I could deal with my pain and she taught me some stress relief and things like that and and it, w- it was good for my mental health altogether and it helped to deal with the pain that I was in but there's a reason that I'm in pain and it didn't fix it. And one of the things that I will will say is that, you know, chronic pain sufferers really often have a hard time finding somebody who will actually believe that they're in pain and try to help them. Chronic pain sufferers are often uh, treated as drug-seeking or hysterical or you know it's just really hard to to find somebody who wants to help and who wants to get to the bottom of what is causing your pain and who will try to treat try to find and treat the underlying cause and not just blow you off so anyway so I did the therapy thing and the therapy thing worked to help manage my pain so I could still like live and then while I was pregnant and immediately after my 
pregnancy, I started to develop nerve pain and like I, I would get nerve pain. I would get uh, kind of like creepy crawly feelings and, uh, and, and stuff like that and, and like uh, restless leg but all over. And, and of course, fatigue, uh, that, uh, went along with that. And, you know, while I was pregnant, everybody said, well, it was, you know, the weight of the baby was pulling on things. And so of course you're in pain and you're pinching nerves and stuff like that. And then immediately after, uh, I had the baby, you know, then everybody said it was postpartum stress and anxiety and, or postpartum depression or, and they kind of just brushed it off. So a year later, I was still having nerve pain, joint pain, muscle weakness, fatigue. And I finally, I went to a new primary doctor and she actually believed me. She actually said, you know, if something's not right, you know that it's not right. I don't know your body. So you know if you're not feeling right. And so she did blood work. Blood work revealed anemia. We treated that for a while with iron supplements and uh, stuff like that. Helped a little bit with the fatigue and things like that. Did not fix the pain. So we did a little more testing and things like that. And she thought, well, maybe that I had fibromyalgia. So she sent me to a rheumatologist Rheumatologist said, you do not have fibromyalgia, as far as I can tell. Again, fibro is one of those things where there's not really a definitive test. It's really a combination of of symptoms and ruling everything else out and saying, well, okay, you've got fibro then. But the rheumatologist said, I think you have Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. And she did a series of of flexibility tests and things like that and uh, so the diagnosis that I got was um, Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome hypermobility type. So what that is is that basically my connective tissue, my joint in my joints, um, collagen in my joints, things like that break down, my joints become loose which makes me super flexible and also does a lot of damage to joints. It causes um, a lot of pain in your nerves because your joints are not moving the way they're supposed to be moving, things like that. And there's also comorbidities with that because when your joints are not moving right, it can also cause other issues. I mean, it causes fatigue and muscle weakness because you're working harder to do the same things that other people are doing. It can cause headaches because the muscles in in your neck and shoulders can cause nerve problems, which can cause tension headaches. And it also, you can have TMJ, which is a problem with your jaw muscles, and that can cause uh, headaches. And also migraines because there's a vascular component to EDS. There's a whole lot of... Uh, comorbidities with EDS um, and often people ha- who have EDS also have fibro also have autoimmune diseases or or something else uh, that goes along with it and also what I also found out was uh, with headaches is um, you can get headaches from eye strain because the muscles that actually your eyes are controlled by muscles and the muscles that actually control your eyes can get fatigued and not work quite right and that will cause if you are using straining your eyes too much using the computer too much doing too much reading whatever can cause headaches because your eyes are tired it also causes uh, you to have some eyesight degenerative eyesight problems so uh, like I wear glasses um, and have since second grade so uh that's that's another another part of uh, EDS um, and there's lots of different types of EDS the type that I have is um, painful but not quite as dangerous there are some some vascular types of EDS which um, can actually cause weakness in blood vessels and 
things like that. And there's also more severe hypermobility ones. And there's some that are combinations and things, some that cause cardiac issues. And uh, thankfully, uh, that's not the type that I have. So the basic upshot of, of my type of EDS is that I have chronic muscle and joint pain. And because of the breakdown of my collagen in my joints and things like that I have arthritis that is pretty severe and because of all of that that I'm battling I have chronic fatigue so treatment wise my rheumatologist is all about physical therapy which is fine physical therapy though is the physical therapy is ostensibly to strengthen your joints and the the muscles around your joints to kind of keep them in place because a lot of times what happens with EDS what happens most often with EDS is that you have joints that slide out of place that dislocate they uh, subluxate or they just don't sit right where they're supposed to so physical therapy is often a a solution for that you know to kind of tighten up your strengthen the muscles around your joints to kind of hold your joints in place but because of our great uh insurance system you know physical therapy is limited by insurance for you can only have so many visits a year and the problem with physical therapy is that you need it if i go to physical therapy for my back then my back gets better but then i also need it for my hip and then my hip gets better but then my knee is hurt so it's it's a ongoing thing that you're never really out of physical therapy because there's always a joint that needs working on also physical therapy does not work well for little joints like in your hands and feet so there's a limit to to some of that so you could be going to physical therapy constantly weekly for the rest of your life or a couple times weekly for the rest of your life but you can't pay for that because our insurance I think is 30 visits a year which is not even once a week usually they want you to go two or three times a week and you know physical therapy for me I went for for my uh for my back for a while and it was painful and it was not that helpful and it it wore me out more than it's more than it helped when I would be done with physical therapy because I would usually go midday I take a break from work and go to physical therapy because that's when they had available for me and so I would go to work and then I would go to physical therapy on my lunch and then I would go back to work and then I I was useless for the rest of the day and then that evening once everything caught up to me work and physical therapy and everything caught up to me I could not function and that was two to three days a week which was not it's not possible when you have a young child and you have a partner who sometimes works the opposite shift of you it's not possible for you to be out of commission you can't do it so it was a lot of fighting to push through that misery and relying on my family for extra help and also and then that takes a a mental toll because I couldn't do what I was supposed to be doing because of the physical therapy which was supposed to be helping me but wasn't really helping me and I might as well just be at square one. It's kind of like a, a, a cycle. I do, well, I don't right now because there's a pandemic, but um, I do go for uh, at least monthly massage because that does help. Um, I get massages uh, with CBD oil, which uh, I firmly believe is is helping me but I haven't had I'm now poised to miss my second month of massage because I had a massage about a week and a half 
week or 10 days before they uh, closed the spa. And I have not had one since, so I'm I'm missing two or probably close to three massages now. And uh, I, I feel it. And could Shannon rub my back? Yeah, but it's not the same thing. So, so that's something that, that right now, and I understand, like, there's a pandemic and there's no real good way to do physical therapy or massage therapy right now when there's, you have to be in contact with pe- people to do that. Like, they, there's, there's no way to do that right now. So I, I get that. But it's been more difficult to manage without those little things and there's a lot of people that really do use massage as an actual treatment. You know, that they don't, it's not just, you know, for relaxation. Although there's a, certainly a, a, an element of that in, in that too. But, um, I don't get relaxing massages most of the time. I get massages that are fairly intense because that's what helps. So I'm missing those. And I can't wait for it to be okay, you know, with some safety measures in place, of course, you know, masks or whatever needs to be. But I can't wait for that to be okay because I miss my massages. As far as medications go, I take anti-inflammatories, over-the-counter anti-inflammatories. I did have a cortisone shot in my shoulder toward the end of last year, which the cortisone shot didn't fix my shoulder by any means but my shoulder joint had kind of was not in place it was kind of floating not exactly where it was supposed to be and so that caused a lot of inflammation which was just excruciating and it got to the point where like I couldn't use my arm and the cortisone shot took down the inflammation enough that it was would allow the joint to heal and go back where and get back to where it was supposed to be so the cortisone shots aren't really cures but they they break the cycle of super inflammation and that that helps a little bit I've had a lot of doctors that have been reluctant to give me anything more substantial than over-the-counter anti-inflammatories and I think you know I don't want to be a zombie. I don't want I don't want medication that's going to like make me drool on myself or you know anything like that. I don't want heavy duty narcotics that I can't drive with and 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 stuff like that. I need to be able to function and live and you know take care of my 2-year-old and 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 work. And I want to continue to do that. But it's uh it's interesting we live in an area where um our county is very uh has been very hard hit with uh heroin use fentanyl oxy all those those bad things and i i find that there's a real reluctance for doctors to give you anything even short term um, and it's also, you know, there's a reluctance of chronic pain sufferers to want to ask for that because I think, you know, we don't want to be seen as drug seekers, you know? So right now I'm just on lots of Tylenol, extra strength Tylenol, arthritis, muscle rubs, uh, vitamin supplements, things like that. And if things get really bad, I'll fall back on a a cortisone shot or something like that. But so that's where I'm at as far as treatment is concerned. And the, the, the big thing here is the toll that chronic illness takes that I don't think that people realize the, the mental toll on a chronic illness sufferer, people People sometimes see the physical. They don't always see the physical because, like in my case, I have spent a lot of time learning to mask my symptoms and learning to say, I'm fine, and keep going. 
because it's hard it's hard to explain to people that you're in pain all the time and you don't want pity and you don't want advice and also you don't want to hear for the 30,000th time that you don't look sick it's it's annoying but I am in pain and I am sick and there's a lot of you know anxiety that goes along with when I'm planning on doing an activity And I look at what it's going to entail and I say, I don't know if I can walk that much. I don't know if I'm going to be able to chase after our daughter. I don't know at the end of the day after work if that's, if I'm going to feel okay to do that. And there's a lot of anxiety with trying to make plans because it's hard to uh, gauge where I'm going to be when those plans actually happen. Oftentimes, I'm making plans and then we're getting ready to go do something and I look at Shannon and I go, I I don't think I can do this. And then it's disappointing for her, it's disappointing for, and frustrating for her, it's disappointing for me, sometimes it's disappointing for our daughter. So there's, there's anxiety pre-planning and then there's when I actually miss something there's depression and guilt and ick and when I don't plan on doing something and then I'm actually having a good day and I could have done it but I didn't because I didn't know then like it just it takes a a a serious toll on a person mentally and it's very somebody who's prone to anxiety and depression to begin with and who has a healthy sense of of guilt like I do it's just it's it it's very hard um and I also you know I feel it it takes a toll on our relationship um and my relationship with friends and things like that but my relationship with Shannon because I don't feel like I can always give a hundred percent I don't feel like I'm contributing enough when there's housework to be done well I can't do the stairs today to take care of the laundry and I can't bend and stretch and all that to do the dishes to do to load the dishwasher and unload the dishwasher and maybe I can't stand at the stove today and cook an elaborate meal there's all these little things or and sometimes I'm just exhausted and if I've been at work even though most of the time I'm working at a desk job I just it hurts you know and so you know if I've been at work and I've then I have to battle the fatigue of having done an activity for six or eight hours and then I have to come home and make dinner or help clean or and sometimes it just doesn't happen and so I hate that I can't give a hundred percent and the same thing goes relationships with friends you know it goes back to that making plans thing there's a lot of times that you know I want to go somewhere with my friends you know go have dinner with my friends but after a a day of and, and maybe it's something that we've been planning for uh a week or a week and a half and uh we're definitely going to do this and, you know, because it's hard for adult friendships for anybody to find any time anyway. But, you know, we plan something for a week or 10 days and then that day comes and I'm like the worst friend ever because I have to go, I can't do this. I just can't handle it. I just need to go home and put my feet up. And, you know, my friends, I think they understand for the most part because they have their own issues and whatever. And sometimes it doesn't work out with them, you know, and they have to cancel it. But I still feel like a shitty friend. And then, you know, so you have all this anxiety and depression and guilt and all of that stuff. And then it makes you... It makes you frustrated and it makes you mad and and then you end up 
taking out that frustration and that and because there's nobody to direct it toward it's your own body that is that is not doing what it's supposed to be doing that's preventing you from from doing the things that you want to do so it's like you can't there's nobody to to direct it at it's nobody else's fault so you can't really take it out on the right people so what ends up happening a lot of the time with Shannon and I is she gets a lot more crap unloaded on her than she deserves you know and sometimes I unload it on other people you know my sister and my mom occasionally get a little burst of it but Shannon really is the the brunt of it and I feel bad I feel bad afterwards but in the moment I'm just like I'm upset that things haven't gone the way I want them to go I'm sad that I can't do what I want to do and I feel I'm making everybody else miserable and you know you just you beat yourself up and you feel like a worthless piece of garbage and then you know because you've now beat yourself up and now you have to let it out on somebody else and I also a lot of the times I think my what comes out with Shannon is like I understand that she is doing her best and I understand that she wants to help me and things like that but sometimes it's hard to express what I need the kind of help that I need which leaves her guessing which makes her try and do shit that I don't need help with and then not do shit that I do need help with and it's my own fault because I don't communicate but it's frustrating and sometimes she'll be disappointed in something and I'll be disappointed in not being able to do something and I just feel like you don't understand how I feel like you don't understand the the amount of pain that I'm in because nobody does nobody can feel the amount of pain that I'm in and because I'm still a functioning human being because I'm doing the best I can to muscle through headaches and pain and awful fatigue and you know not being able to hold my head up and not being able to stand up straight and all all of these things that I'm muscling my way through and making myself do people don't see you can't see the effort that is put into doing that and you can't see how exhausting it is and you can't see and there's no real good way or easy way to make someone understand the kind of pain and the kind of work it is to get through that pain and all of the all of the crap that is that you're dealing with and it's very frustrating because like I wouldn't wish this pain on anybody but I also kind of wish that somebody understood how it feels so that I didn't have to try and do the mental gymnastics of trying to explain what my daily struggle is and then of course you know our daughter does not understand if I can't pick her up if I say you know she is 36 pounds and there are days that 36 pounds does not come off the ground for me I just physically can't do it and she doesn't understand that she wants up you know and I get that And she wants to go play outside and she wants to, she wants me to take her for walks and things like that. And I can't always do it. And that makes me feel terrible. You know, there are days that I can't even just sit on the floor and color with her because I can't get down there. Or if I get down there, I don't think I can get back up. And things like even, you know, giving her a bath and leaning over the tub on my knees. Yeah, some days that just doesn't go. And when I have good days, I try my hardest to include her in my good day and do the best that I 
can with her and and try to do those things that I normally can't do if I'm having a really good day but but she doesn't how do you explain to her that and I I try I say you know mommy hurts you know things like that but how do you really explain to her that I know you want to go for a walk but I just can't do it and uh, and she hears things. She's at that age where she's picking things up and she's repeating things that we say. And I guess I didn't realize how much I was complaining because I try not to complain. But now she does this thing where she goes, oh, my back hurts. And I know it's because she's listening to me say, oh, my back hurts. Oh, that really hurts. Oh, it hurts, you know, all the time. And she's mimicking me. And and that makes me sad because I don't want her to hear that mommy is always in pain. And that mommy can't do things. And it's it's hard. It's it's very hard. And and that takes a a, a huge emotional toll on me because in deep dark thoughts i am thinking that it was a selfish thing to bring her into the world if i can't do the things that she wants me to do and i can't be the that kind of parent that is always going and doing with their kid what did i do it for you know what why did i have her then and things get dark like that it's it's tough and i think the thing that is a struggle for chronic pain and chronic illness sufferers is advocating for yourself and it, it's it's tiring because you already don't feel good and do I want to go around and around and around with the health insurance people if I can even get a hold of them ever do I want to go around and around and around in a circle with them and tell them why I need more physical therapy when they think I don't and do I want to go doctor shopping to find somebody who actually believes that I have a problem and is going to try to address it and if I go doctor shopping for somebody who's actually going to address my problem are they going to think that I'm doctor shopping because I want drugs are they going to think that I'm crazy are they going to send me for a bazillion tests that my health that I have to argue with my health insurance about and then there's also the the mental health component that you have to advocate for yourself on because I mean here's the easy thing everybody says to me well you're in so much pain why don't you stop working and go on disability well a first you have a doctor have to have a doctor that believes that you're in enough pain And you're debilitated enough to sign off on that. Secondly, not working does not mean not working. I mean, there's no world in which I'm going to not have a paying job and just lay in bed all day. Because if I don't have a job, I'm going to be trying to take care of my house and my family. Like, if I'm not working 40 hours or 35 hours a week, I'm I'm not going to be laying in bed. That's not something that I can do. So, I mean, that's not going to help. And it's not going to help my mental health because if I'm, as evidenced by this pandemic, if I'm stuck in the house staring at four walls and barely getting out, that's going to make my depression and my guilt and my anxiety worse not better and that in turn that stress and anxiety and guilt and all of that and then on add add on top of that the fact that I would not be getting the kind of money that I'm making now if I was on disability so add to the that stress the stress of you know trying to support a family or help support a family, that's going to make my pain worse. Things are going to flare up because I'm stressed out and anxious and all this stuff. And because I'm not in a good mental space, 
it's going to be harder to deal with and it's just going to be a vicious vicious cycle and go out of control so and I think making people understand there's a lot of times that people are like well we're offering solutions and you're telling us all the reasons that they won't work and a lot of it is okay sometimes I'm just you know being a negative Nelly and that's fine and okay you can call me out on that but a lot of the times it's because I've already done the mental gymnastics of okay well what if I do this well what if I do that well what if I and looked at the scenarios because I'm a worrier and that's what I do anyway and also because I know myself um, and that's one of the things that I find I've, I've only ever found one doctor who said you know yourself so if you're telling me something's not right we're gonna figure out what it is I've only ever heard one doctor say that and that's that's a a sad state of affairs because you obviously wouldn't be going to the doctor if you didn't think something was not right and for for most doctors to just poo poo you unfortunately that doctor I found that that great doctor and uh she went into administration and 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 left her her practice and uh, I have not found a doctor since then that has been so affirming but so you know so there's there's pros and cons for for everything but I think it's very hard in the face of insurance and medical professionals and mental health professionals all kind of downplaying your complaints or your issues um, it's very hard to keep advocating for yourself and I, I think there's been many times that I've just said well I'm not even going to bother going to a new doctor or trying to figure out what's going on because they're all just going to brush me off. They're all going to either think I'm crazy or think I'm trying to get attention or or something and you know it's not worth the mental exhaustion that it takes to try and advocate and try and and be heard and be believed and and get solutions you know all of that that whole diagnosis to treatment thing that whole long progression of stuff it very rarely all plays out with one doctor because you have for every one doctor that believes you you have had five that have turned you away so it's very tough and then the other the other thing that is advocating for yourself with your in your home life and your your family life and your work life to an extent I have a super amazing boss so I don't have to really do a whole heck of a lot to in my workplace because I have a boss who knows what's going on who checks on me who gives me the freedom to say I cannot do this today so I in that respect I am am super duper lucky and I know a lot of people aren't that lucky but at home and with my family like I said it's very difficult it's very difficult for me to say I cannot do this thing and this is what I need help with I get very overwhelmed you know and say I have to get these I have to do these things I have to do that thing and what I should be saying is these things need to get done and I know what I can do but I need to ask somebody for help with what I can't do and I'm I hate asking for help but I will say that I think the major thing that has uh that chronic illness has taught me is some some humility and some uh it makes me say this is too much and I need help. It's difficult and it will always be difficult for me to to say I can't right now. 
it's too much. I will always try and do more than I can, and I will always suffer the consequences having done more than I can. But what chronic illness has has taught me is that I need to reach out and say, today is not a good day. Today is a day that I need help, and this is how you can help me. Because the other thing that I've learned, um, you think I would have known this by now, but the other thing that I've learned is that Shannon cannot read my mind. My parents cannot read my mind. My employees cannot read my mind. Nobody can read my mind. It's very weird. And so if I need something, I need to say that I need something. And so, you know, I'm, I'm constantly learning and I'm, I'm constantly learning new things about the condition that I have and what it's going to mean um, for me in the future. And uh, that's a whole nother scary prospect, but, you know, more stuff to add to my anxiety. But right now it's, I'm managing and, uh, you know, I give uh, all, all of the chronic illness and chronic pain sufferers out there who wake up every day well done to you and if you wake up and you pull yourself out of bed well good for you and if you manage to go to work well I think you're amazing and because I understand there are degrees of accomplishment and some days the most you can do is get out of bed and pull on a different pair of pajamas and some days you can go to work for an eight-hour day and the frequency of each of those occurrences depends on the person and depends on the condition but both are accomplishments when you have a chronic illness and when you're a chronic pain sufferer and especially when you have an invisible illness or mostly invisible illness and people around you are not making accommodations for you because they have no idea what's going on. So if you have a chronic illness or chronic syndrome or Whatever you've got going on, I want to say be gentle with yourself, be kind to yourself, and uh, do what you can do, know your limits, and uh, advocate for yourself, take care of yourself, and uh, just keep swimming, because you're not alone. There are lots of us, some who are more vocal than others. Um, but there, there are lots of us and just do what you can do. Uh, so that's, that's the end of my, my, uh, tale of chronic illness woes, but at least now I hope that, that our regular listeners understand a little bit about what I'm talking about, uh, in the, the larger podcast episodes and, uh, thank you for listening and we'll, uh, Talk again soon. Bye. This has been Coffee Break, presented by Our Life in Transition. Our producer is Shannon McDill. Our theme music is Silky Smooth by Jens Kielsoff. Support us on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash olitpod. That's forward slash O-L-I-T-P-O-D. Your support makes this show possible. Thank you.